Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. We're his people, and so our inheritance, our our reward, if you can get this, is actually intimacy with him. There may be more that follows, but the greatest reward is the intimacy in the first place. That if we draw near without any other agenda or motivation or, you know, hypocrisy, he's just saying, here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you me. We're going to be together. Today, we complete part two of Pastor Sam's message, Prayer and Fasting. Here, we learn about the how and why of these also important things, as well as the heart behind them that our Lord desires for us to have. Let's listen in as Sam begins in Matthew 6, verse 6. So when we pray, he instructs us, go into your room, and when you've shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. In contrast to the hypocrite, he says, you go pray in your room. Now you need to know that this isn't limiting us to private prayer in our room. In fact, Isaac prayed out in a field. Jesus himself, who tells us here to pray in our room, prayed on the top of a mountain. Peter later prays on the top of a rooftop. What's the point? Wherever you can get away from people and get alone with the Lord, that would be a good place to pray. And so he's saying, pray in your room. Well, if you live in a small apartment with a lot of people, your room may not work. And maybe pray in your car. And when you shut the door, and make sure the radio's off, make sure you drive out of the driveway and park somewhere where people aren't going to see it, then have some time with the Lord. Take some time for serious praise and prayer. And, and so when he talks about your room, he's saying we need to find a place where we can really be private with the Lord, where we won't be distracted. And that's the idea of shutting the door, to minimize distractions, to minimize disruptions. Why? Because we're bombarded constantly with all sorts of images and sounds, and it's just difficult to focus in. By the way, in a very practical way, because we're all into multitasking now, you know, it's a new world and we're new people and we can do three things at once. So if you're one of those that think you can watch TV and and pay your bills on your computer as you have your prayer time with the Lord, (laughs) let me suggest to you, no, that won't work. You can't do that. Any more than you can read the paper and watch the news while you talk to your wife or listen to your wife. I mean, let's face it, we're not talking back. We're just grunting. Mm, ah, mm-hmm, mm-mm. You know, you want some slop? Sure. You know, it, it's like we don't even hear it. We don't care. And, and so my point is this. If in our communication in our marriages, well, you get more of that from Bob tonight. But in our communication in our marriages, if, if we're not really paying attention, if we're not really focusing in, if we're not getting eye to eye and, and face to face and heart to heart, well, we're missing something. And, and when it comes to, to, as we saw last time, giving, that's about our relationship to people. This is about our relationship to God directly. So if we're not really honing in on the fact that God's listening and he's there and and he's desiring. And this is the most amazing thing of all. He actually wants to be intimate with us. He wants that close connection with each and every one of us. That's mind-blowing to consider that, that the God who is so powerful, he could just say, let there be and all this appeared. He would want to have personal, private, quiet time with me. And what's he saying? Go into the quiet place, shut the door, lock the world out, turn the radio off, turn the TV off, shut off the cell phone, turn off the pager, let's just get alone. And and that's what the Lord is directing us to do here. Well, when you pray then, he says, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father. You know, a lot of people who believe in God, when they actually approach God, it's all about, hey, you know what? the man upstairs, I don't know if they pray, oh, hey, old man upstairs, but, but if your concept is he's the man upstairs or he's distant or he's not really touchable or, listen, he says to pray our father. We're going to look at that in detail and depth, but even here, he says pray to your father. He wants you to know it's relational. It's not just informational. We're not just passing needs and and notes and, hey, I got this going, Lord, if you could help out over here. And, And he talks more about that in a moment. But he says, pray to your father, commune with him, communicate with him. And then something I have trouble doing, so I think maybe some of you might have trouble doing, and that's just waiting on him. You see, if you're going to have an effective prayer life, you need to understand that prayer is a two way communication. God's intention is that we would speak to him and then we would hear from him. Now, 
I don't personally hear voices, and my friends in, that are psychologists and such, they say that's a good thing. And, uh, and, and so I'm not troubled by the fact that I don't hear voices. But, and I have noticed that some people say, well, God speaks to me audibly. And, and hey, he may do that. But I have noticed, and I'm not picking on you, but I, I have noticed that most people who tell me that, they're fairly strange, you know, and, and, and they just are. You know, they're, they come up and they said, the Lord spoke to me. And I'm like, truly? He said audibly. And I'm like, whoa. And they're like, he has a word for you. I'm like, what is it? And then they give me this bizarre, obscure thing. I can like, what does that mean? They go, I have no clue. And, and I'm like, well, I don't have any clue. And ordinarily, when God speaks to me, he speaks in a way that I can understand him. Why? Isn't that the whole point of communication? To make your heart known, to make yourself known, to, to make your will or your desires known, to bless that person, to draw them close. And so communication that isn't communicating anything, it's not from the Lord. I had someone come up and ask me, I, I can't remember when it was. It was the other, other night after Wednesday night or Friday night after some night. And the guy said, can the Lord speak to someone just once? Have him prophesy to you? And I said, yeah, I think so. I mean, it happened. Saul was anointed just once to prophesy. And they said, hey, Saul's among the prophets. Only happened once. I said, that can happen. And they said, well, somebody said something to me a long time ago. And I've been trying to figure it out for, you know, like 10 years. I'm like, that's not the Lord. When the Lord speaks, you know. You know it's him. And you know what he's trying to say. And, and, and so the, the thing is, is if you're going to come to the Lord in prayer, and, and my prayer is that we'll be more serious about prayer as a result of our time and study. See, we can learn about prayer, but that's not prayer. We can study and affirm and all that stuff and, and make sense of it, but we got to actually pray to have a prayer life. And, and, and when I pray, I try to do three things. I come to the Lord with an open schedule. What that means is I, I'm going to have some time that, that I definitely have some time. I'm not going to say, well, I got appointment in two minutes, Lord. Maybe they'll be late. Let's spend some time together. <laughs> Pam doesn't like that, and I don't think the Lord would like it either. Better for the two minutes with them than not at all. But I'm saying if you care about someone and you want a deeper, closer relationship, you cultivate and you schedule out the time. And so you've got an open schedule. And then you have an open heart. You're not just talking to the Lord, but you're listening to the Lord. And, and I find that he speaks best to me through his word. So I not only have an open schedule and an open heart, I have an open Bible. And, and I'll just read through the scripture. And I'll say, Lord, I know that you want to speak to me. And, and of course, he's not limited to what I'm reading right now. Anything I've ever read in his word, anything I've ever heard, he promises by his spirit he can bring that to my remembrance. He can do that for you too. So, so you don't even have to have your Bible open, but I just find it's a good thing. To, to open my heart to him, to open my time to him, and to open his word and say, Lord, speak to me. I want to be changed. I want to think like you do. I want to be like you are. And, and so I need, and, and you need, to learn to wait on the Father, to, to not just pray, but to pause and to wait and to listen. And, and note this, even as he said the hypocrite gets a reward, he says you, in contrast to the hypocrite, you'll be rewarded likewise, well, as well. Maybe not likewise, because does that mean the same as the hypocrite? Oh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. But uh, he who sees in secret will reward you openly there in, in the latter part of verse 8. Now, now, here's the thing with prayer. Some of us have been led to believe that when we pray, the reward will be we get whatever we're praying for. That hasn't been my personal experience. Sometimes I get what I'm praying for, but oftentimes God's like... You're so far from getting it, aren't you? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give you that. I'm not going to mess you up that way. So God doesn't always answer the way I think he should or will. And we'll talk more about that next time. But, but where I'm going with this is that there are rewards promised for drawing near to the Lord. You know, to Abraham in Genesis 15, God said, Hey, I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. He said, Abraham, you've got me. This is what you get. Draw near to me. You get me. Hey, that is an amazing deal when it's God making the offer. But, but not just there. Throughout the scriptures, you find these kinds of things. Joshua and, and uh, Joshua 13, 33, when they are divvying up the land to the various tribes, the 12 tribes, it comes to the Levites. Those were the tribes chosen to be the tribe chosen to be the priest. And God says, I'm not going to give you inheritance as I am the others. They have their land. They've got their temporal blessings. I will be your inheritance. He says he's made us a kingdom, a nation of priests unto him. We're his people. And so our inheritance, our reward, if you can get this, is actually intimacy with him. There may be more that follows, but the greatest reward is the intimacy in the first place. That if we draw near without any other agenda or motivation or, you know, hypocrisy, he's just saying, here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you me. We're going to be together. 
You're going to sense my presence. You're going to sense my love in, in a profound and radical way. Well, verse 7, yet another warning. When you pray, again, for the third time in this little section, when you pray, assuming that will be happening, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Vain repetition. Listen, this happens in so many circles and it happens in so many different ways. The word vain just means futile or useless, you know, mindless. I'll never forget my early days in Laguna Beach and hanging around, you know, as the hippie days and, and we were kind of out of it. And, and, and I heard these guys chanting and, and they, they were playing tambourines and singing Hare Krishna. And, and, and it started, well, that sort of sounds cool, you know. And so we kind of wandered over there and we wanted to find out what they were all about. <sighs> Were they weird? It, it, pink skirts, guys and gals, you know, weird hair, bad food, and in and, and a very limited song, you know, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna. I mean, come on. But here's the deal. It, it all was born out of that Eastern meditation mindset where you empty your mind and, and you get a mantra and you just say these syllables or these words or the, these things over and over and over and over and over. That's one way people get involved in vain repetition. It's not the only way, but it is one way. It's just saying the same thing, the idea that I'm emptying my mind. Listen, biblical meditation is the exact opposite of Eastern meditation, at least that form of emptying your mind, this mindless babbling. Biblical meditation, it's spelled out for us in Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful. It says his delight is in the law of the Lord and in it he meditates day and night. The idea is you're filling your mind with, with the word of God and you're chewing on that, thinking about it. You ever take a bite of something that tasted so good you didn't want to swallow? You're just like, oh man, I just want to savor this as long as I can. That's what he's talking about is, is taking it in and then just chewing on it. Why? Because taste and see that the word is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The, the idea being... Anybody who's trying to empty their mind, listen, we've already lost too much to risk emptying it anymore. <laughs> we need to fill our mind with good things, with godly things, with the word of God. And, and so the mantras, the mindless mantras, and, and, and listen, if that's your thing, I want you to know it's unbiblical. I'm not picking on you. I'm going to pick on some other people in a minute, and they're going to be bummed as much as you. But, but, but the thing is... Before I ever saw the Hare Krishnas and, and their weirdness, I had been introduced to a religious system at about the age of 13 that taught me that when I sinned, what I needed to do was go and make confession and then do penance. Now, if you come from that tradition or that background, hear me out, because I, I don't want anybody to misunderstand. I'm not picking on the system. I'm not anti well, I'm not, do I have to say anti-Catholic? Does everybody not know that that's Catholic, that it's, that it's penance? But, but here's the deal. The Bible calls us to repentance, and there's a great difference. Repentance focuses on the seriousness of my sin as I see it in light of the cross. I see that Jesus was nailed to the cross for me. He shed his blood for me. He died on the cross for me. And so God doesn't call me to add to that in any way, but to receive that and to repent of my sin, to turn from my sin. That's what repentance means. But, but here's, here's the real problem for me. I'm not saying with everybody. Here was my problem with penance. I'm a fast talker. Have you noticed that? I make an effort to really slow down. I've really tried. This is me slowed down. This is as slow as I'm going to get unless you know, I have a stroke or something. And then I don't know if I'll be any good to you anyway. But, but I, I've tried hard and, and that's, this is what's happened. But in those days, because I was told, well, go pray these, do ten Our Fathers. You know the Our Father? We're going to study it next time, the Lord's Prayer. I found that I could do that prayer in just about 15 seconds, believe it or not. I'm not going to do it for you right now. Maybe next week. We'll see. But, but the, the bottom line is how mindless, how meaningless, if, if God was actually tuning into that, how, I don't know. I just don't think he received it. When I'm just saying something so fast as I can, I'm going to get through it. So it's totally a religious duty. But, but it wasn't any kind of a, a, a passion on my heart to say, Father, forgive me. I mean, there's some beautiful things in the Lord's Prayer. That's why we're going to spend a whole day studying it together. Not a whole day, literally. Not 24 hours. Just probably 40 or 50 minutes. But, but my point is that it, it's so beautiful what he teaches us to pray in this, this template he gives us for prayer. We want to lock into that. 
But if you're just mindlessly ripping this thing and saying this thing, then that's, that's what he's warning us about. Vain repetition. I've got friends of the Pentecostal persuasion. And, and while I believe all spiritual gifts are available today, I've been in a lot of prayer meetings in Pentecostal circles where, where, where people who have the gift of tongues or something like the gift of tongues, a legitimate biblical gift, if you're unaware of it, you can check it out. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, tapes are available. But, but I, I've been around people that, that they, they get into their, their, what they call their prayer language or speaking in tongues. I've got some confusion personally over the prayer language part because tongues in the Bible were always foreign languages, but that's another lesson. Let me just say this. When people start speaking in a language they don't know and they say the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, how can that be any better than saying the same thing over and over and over and over again in a language you do know? It's still vain babbling. That's really my point. Am I saying tongues are bad? No. Am I saying it shouldn't be news? No. There's a place for them. I think they they work real well in the prayer closet just like prayer, but there are reasons for that. But but here's my point. If we are saying in any language, praise you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Oh, Lord, you're good. Praise you, Lord. And and, And that's sort of a fourth thing that I jotted down, that constant affirmation. Sometimes I pray with people and they're like, yes, Lord, thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. And then someone else is over there and they're saying, I don't know what they're saying, but it sounds a lot like that. You know, it's three, three or four syllables over and over and over and over. And I'm like, man, you're distracting me. I'm trying to talk to the Father. And, and you're like, rah, 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 you know. It's, if you were a TV, I'd turn you off. But you're live and in person. And, and, and because that happens, we need to check our motivations. We need to say, Lord, is that what I do? You know, there's nothing wrong with, with agreeing in prayer, but you can do that under your breath. If you're in a group praying and someone's praying and, and, you're, and your heart is saying, yes, Lord, I, I agree, Lord, me too, Lord. Well, that's fine to say that, but you should be saying it a tenth of the volume of the person who's praying. Why? Because how can anyone else say yes, Lord, if you are interrupting constantly? It's chaos. It's confusion. And God isn't the author of confusion. Well, there are other ways we can get involved in vain repetition, but the whole point is... If it's repetitious, it may be vain. Now, now know this. It's not always going to be that way. Be- because our Lord prays three times in the garden. Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. He prayed those same things three times. Listen, that wasn't vain repetition. That was just seeking for confirmation. Father, are you sure? I mean, if there's another way, if, 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 if she could be saved, if he could be saved, if we can be saved any other way, let's go that way. Why? What was Jesus saying? That if it's possible for us to get to God any other way but through him and his sacrifice on the cross, well, he wanted that. Jesus didn't want to die that shameful, painful, horrible, torturous death. He did it willingly, but only because there was no other way. And so it's possible to pray and pray again. He's not saying once you've prayed, don't ever you know, bring it up again. But he's saying, don't get into a vain repetition where you're just saying the words, but you're not even grasping the meaning, where you're going through the motions, but you're not for real with God. And so that last thing we read there in verse 8, too, it kind of it blows your mind the first time you realize it. Don't be like them, he says, contrasting us once again with them. And I like that. Contrasting the, the, the believer who prays and, and, pray, and praises in and, and, and reality with the hypocrite. He says, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Your father knows. He's omniscient. That's a theological term. That means when we're praying, we're not educating God about our situation or enlightening him. And sometimes I hear people praying like that. I know they're not praying to us. They really are praying to God. But they're praying like he's been clueless or on vacation or has been missing stuff. And all of a sudden you realize, hey, God knows everything. Calm down. Just just say, Lord, I'm in big trouble here. He knows that. The whole point is we're humbling ourselves enough to come and say, Lord, I need your help. I need your wisdom. I need your guidance. I need you, Lord. So we're not educating, enlightening, or listing God's options. And I hear people do all of those things in prayer. Nor are we convincing and directing or limiting his options. Sometimes people think, well, if I just keep going, God will give up. You know, it's like the child that says, if I badger him long enough, he'll give me the keys. He'll give me the money. He'll give me something. Just go, go, go. Just leave me alone. God's never going to say yes to that. He's never going to go for that. Why? He's just going to say, I'm not, I'm not tuning into this. We're not connecting on this. And so real prayer is going to realize, okay, God already knows everything. He told me to pray, so I'm coming, Lord, because you told me to bring my needs to you. You told me to humble myself before you. You told me to to trust in you. And, And what's really going on? 
We're drawing near to God. That's what he wants in the first place. Close communication, connectedness. Hey, isn't that what everyone who loves someone wants? They want to be loved in return. They want to connect. That's what God's trying to do. Well, we conclude with this deal of fasting. And, and, and I realize we're spending far less time on fasting than prayer. We may get some more of it next time. The Lord may convict me as he did in this, the study on divorce to do a whole day on it. But the, the whole deal with fasting, if we get it, is we see this very close connection between prayer and fasting because, well, the primary purpose of, of fasting is to deny myself physically that I might tune in and, and tune up spiritually. I, I, I'm neglecting food. The word to fast, both in the Hebrew language of the Old Testament and the Greek language of the New Testament, literally means to cover the mouth, to abstain. Now, it may be that there are lots of other applications, and, and oftentimes we're guilty of saying, okay, you know, fasting in our day should be turning off the TV, turning off the entertainment, not going down to the gym, or, or, or you know, in my case, maybe just not talking. Because if to cover the mouth or, you know, abstain, hey, that would work. But in the Bible, almost without exception, exclusively fasting is about food. But it's not, as I shared in the introduction, about dieting. It's about denying myself physically. If I'm dieting and I'm pretending to fast, isn't that hypocrisy? If the very reason I'm doing it is I want to be thinner or I want to be healthier, even if I have a good motivation for it, but I'm pretending my motivation is spiritual, well, that's hypocrisy. Now, I'm not saying you guys shouldn't diet. I, I'm not saying you need to diet, but I'm not saying you shouldn't. If you need to diet, fine. But you don't call it a fast. If you have a, a, a petition list and you're just going to come to the Lord and say, hey, I need this and I want this and I had to have this, I, this is coming up and that's going to go on down and Lord, that's not real prayer. And so fasting and prayer, man, they go together like this. I deny myself physically. It's this simple. Eating takes time. Why? Because first you got to go shop and buy the food. And, and then you got to bring it home and, and you got to unpackage it. And then you got to cook it. And then you got to eat it. And then you got to clean up after it. And so if you deny yourself, not just a meal, but, but a day, a lot, that's the Jewish fast, by the way, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. If, if you were to deny yourself eating for just those 12 hours, I know you're going to pig out at 6.01, and that's okay. <laughs> but that means no breakfast, no lunch, and you're going to have a nice, reasonable, sensible dinner. And, uh, but, but because you didn't shop or prepare or eat or clean up for breakfast or for lunch, if you can get through that, you know, then, then, and if you're doing that, by the way, if you're working, you don't do it on your day that you're working. You go to work all spaced out and you're like, oh man, what's wrong with you? I'm not eating anything. I'm on the spiritual thing, you know? They're going to be like, hey, I had you to work, not to space out at work. And, and so you got to make it your time, your private time. But, but if you fast and you abstain from food and you say, God, I just want to do this as unto you. If you've never done it before, I highly recommend it. If you've done it before, I don't have to recommend it. Because the very fact that we're denying ourselves physically in order to engage him spiritually, you've got to know good things are going to come from that practically. Well, that leaves us here. Most of us today can pray our Father. Not all of us can pray our Father, though. Why? Contrary to public, you know, opinion when it comes to the things of God. We're not all children of God. Jesus is the one who said, you must be born again. Unless a man or a woman be born again, he'll never see, she'll never see the kingdom of God. It, it isn't that we're his child, we're his creation, but he wants us to be his child. How does that happen? I realize that I was made for God, by God, for God, and my sin has separated me from God. I see the purpose of the cross. Jesus died for my sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. I humble myself before him and I pray an honest prayer. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, there's no actual sinner's prayer. We pray a prayer like, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me my sin. Be my Lord and Savior. It's not unbiblical to pray it, but it, it's, it's extra biblical. It's not in the Bible. The, the prayers that are in the Bible, the ones that I, I see instant answers to, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, help. I, and those kind of prayers, they get an answer. Why? They're real. It is one thing to be told that you have a Father in Heaven, and it's quite another when we embrace the reality of this truth. You see, we can have no greater advocate than we have in Jesus, and there can be no greater way for us to celebrate in this than through an open line of communication with Him. Join us next time as Pastor Sam looks at the Lord's Prayer, Jesus' beautiful template for our prayers. 
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.